that brings up a really important point that we we've talked about plenty of times before, and that is tooling for your games. Um, and what you're talking about there with that VR experience where you wanted to display the name, you had to write some sort of tooling to facilitate that. And and I think that's something that, you know, a lot of maybe new develop, game developers don't really consider when they're working on some game. Maybe it's a platformer or an RPG. You know, you take for granted that you can just kind of set up, for instance, your level in the Unity editor with, you know, dragging stuff into your scene. But, you know, maybe you maybe as your game progresses, that level um, has certain rules that can easily be broken by just dragging stuff into the scene. So then you maybe you make a level editor um, that is completely outside of the game. It's just literally a tool. And that tool could just be a .NET application, WPF application that writes to a note, uh, a text file or a JSON file that your game can read in and use to build the level on start. You know, so I mean, that's just one example. But tooling is such an important thing, something that I've actually really wanted to you know, cover on the channel. Um, shoot, man. Yeah, and I've literally, I've done that too. Like I've done a very simple version where you just render a grid into a WinForms application. Yeah. Based on where you click, you, you you put textures and then you spit out a text file that's, you know, 0-1-1-0 and for each a column in a row and you read it in and it just generates a, a 3D map relative to it. <laughs> very quick way to give somebody a way of generating their own data without having to worry too much about opening Unity or even installing Unity, right? It can just be a single .NET application. Yeah. So yeah, sometimes that's a, <laughs> easier, easier for <laughs> and you know what's interesting i think tooling is much like uh, uh writing tests for your game in that you know when you write your game to be testable or your code to be testable um it's it's uh it's easier to well test but not just from a low level standpoint but your classes are designed to allow for injection so you can easily put like dummy classes things that you can like use to test in the editor much easier um like editor specific classes uh that are designed just for development like setting up a scene for development um mm. but same thing with writing tools when you have to write a tool for your game that means you have to sort of think about how do i separate the setting up this particular feature or game mechanic in a way that information can be fed into it and that way um, it really makes your it really makes from code that's more flexible and also code that's easier to test and to work with in development because you know, I mean, sometimes you just want to test a particular feature. And, and if you have this game that is completely inflexible and co totally coupled, then it is just your game. But if you've written in a way that it's open for testing and tooling, then you can sort of uh, um, manipulate it to to be in a certain state for a particular test much, much easier because all those classes and all those systems and features are designed to sort of be kind of like plug and play or like little toys in a toy box that you kind of put together. Plus a feature extension too, right? Like, hmm. for example, you could True. build a level or you could build a level reader, which doesn't have to be the most complicated thing in the world. It can literally be read a 2D array and then generate geometry from it. And with the intent of hard coding it every time, like you're not going any further than that to start. And then later on, you can save out the files. All of a sudden, it's much easier to save levels than it was before. And then you can go one step further and you can read in levels and you can have user-created content. It wasn't an original feature, but now is an easy thing to implement. And you can go one step further and say, hey, maybe I'll make a version of my game which is infinite generated levels. Yeah. You didn't plan for that, but now all you have to do is build a new generator that spits new files out and then saves them and loads them in. So you're kind of, you're allowing yourself to extend things just by making your life easier. And probably that's all of that as an aside from the fact that if you do use tooling, the whole point of it is to make life easier to generate content. And most yeah. games live and die on the number of, um, the amount of content they have. <laughs> Yeah. So, like, literally, you can make a tool, hand it to somebody, and say, <laughs> make loads of cool weapons and guns and swords and stuff, and you don't yeah. need me to do it. Just do it and drop it in, and, you know, the code will generate it for us, you know? Especially MMOs. <laughs> I gotta say it, man. Live and die by content. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> but another thing, too, a lot of people think think that when we're talking about tooling, we're talking constantly about some external .NET application or, right. or external yeah. website or something. Not necessarily. It doesn't have to be, yeah. yeah. You, can, you can do tooling inside of Unity. Common mm -hmm. example being if you've got a, uh, I had a cool little side menu I did where we had um, scenes in the application that were structured by uh, episodes. It was an episodic thing. Mm. And the way we did it is we read the all of the files that were scenes from the, the, the active scenes in build. And we generated a drop down menu at the top of Unity that would let us jump to the right scenes based on chapters. Uh, other stuff we've done in the past is um, you can do pre processors for your assets. So say, for example, you, you've made your own localization system. 
Mm. The idea is that you're reading in all of your audio files and you're building scriptable objects that contain the audio file, a certain name based on some language, English audio, the Chinese audio, the whatever else. What you can do is you can build a processor that will read each file when it does a build step, when you drop it in, and then do something to it. So for example, we built a system where as long as we named the audio file, uh, the sequence underscore en underscore ch or whatever, just by dropping it into the project, it would look for the scriptable object that it needed to exist. If it didn't, it would make it. And once it made it, it would add to the array position for that object reference to the, um, the particular language uh, type it was and reference the character code. So you drop in a file, wouldn't do anything else. And in your uh, system, if you change the language to CH, all the calls to get audio clips would pass in the CH. It would find the appropriate audio file and do it for you. All of this done in terms of just you know creating one script one time. And think of how much work that would be. It's all tiny amounts of work. Yeah. But if you had to open up a scriptable object, name it based on the new audio file, drag in the one for the <laughs> Chinese language thing, you decided to add a new language, drop it in, find it in hierarchy, drop the next. It's, it's all this good yeah. work that adds. The yeah. more of this stuff you can automate, the more tooling you can do. And it can be in Unity as opposed to some third-party giant system. You know? Yeah, yeah. And the great thing is that uh, all of that, especially when it's in Unity, or well, yeah, especially when it's in Unity, um, you can push it to the repository. And if you have other folks on your team, you just say, hey, look, pull the project, open up this tool, and do whatever you need to do. Um, and it's good. I mean, I, th I guess speaking from the perspective of an indie game developer, um, you need to be able to pull other people into the project to help you at later stages where um, it becomes less of trying to build your game and more of, okay, it's built. Now I need to fill it with content, you know, uh, in the instance of like a, a platformer, you might spend the first phase of building this platformer, designing the mechanics, you know, the key mechanics that differentiate your platform from others. Um, maybe you've de you've def defined the art style and you have all your assets ready to go with music and sound. But then eventually you're just going to have to spend a huge portion of your time making levels, filling out dialogue trees, trying to determine how boss fights and boss mechanics are, are laid out. And if you've laid the groundwork and create, created the tools that facilitate uh, creating that content, then it's very easy to, to offload that to other people, um, other talented people who could come up with really great levels. Um, mm. And then I think I, I also saw mentioned up here in the chat that, uh, you know, if you don't want to make an MMO or a multiplayer game, the next best thing you know, that's just one way to look at it. The next best thing is to have player created content. And so if you have something like Mario Level Maker, um, something akin to that in your game, then you open it up to the whole community who plays your game. It could be a single player game, but then they could go ahead, use your tools that you've exposed now to the public uh, to make levels. And, you know, you now you have a whole community around your game. So just just a lot of uh, it's very open to 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 the possibilities Um that are available when you actually start adding tooling to your game. Uh, so definitely an important, important thing. Definitely want to make a video too. about that. Yeah, that's just, that's <laughs> that'd be a great topic. Idea for video right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> write that um, down. The other one too is, is a lot of people who are gamers themselves are a bit skittish about the idea of being very generated with their content. So uh, obviously we're saying tooling doesn't necessitate having to do digital generation. They're not the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can use the tooling just in-house to make content for your game. Mm -hmm. um, but it is worth noting, too, that you can actually, if, if you want to, you can use the procedural <laughs> generation first, then edit it yourself in runtime or, or, you know, before you make the build. So a lot of people think about procedural generation as, oh, I must have a dungeon where the maze is unique. every It's, it's randomly generated <laughs> every time, and it's not very satisfying, and why would I bother completing it? Well, you as a content creator can use, in your build before you even made the game, generator to generate loads of mazes, play them, find the fun ones, move some walls around, change some stuff, and then save it. You don't have to ship the procedural generator. You can use the procedural generator to just cut out a large portion of work that would be you trying to tease out what's a good shape or design. So oftentimes, if you're playtesting and trying to find something that's fun, you can just create a bunch of randomizers, play with it, find the ones that work, and give yourself a special button you can press on the keyboard that'll say, write to a file or save to a critical object current configuration of these settings and now you've got like you can basically play your game to create levels for your game you know and they'll give you ideas and stuff as you go through so procedural generation doesn't have to be a villain in terms of making your game rote and boring it can be something you use just as a as a way to sort of ease out the good parts of your um your gameplay you know yeah and another thing too about tooling is that 
sometimes you think of tooling and, and maybe you get, I mean, let me just speak from my perspective. Sometimes I look at tooling and I get really bogged down and, oh, I got to make it have a, you know, great UI and it's got to, it's got to, it's got to function very well and have all this error handling. Sometimes you just need to automate some process, you know, like Jason was talking about earlier. And in those cases, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be even close to perfect. When you go to release it to the public or if you try to bring other people onto your team, yeah, you should probably make sure that it doesn't corrupt your data, break your game and throw a bunch of exceptions. But in the case of it's just something you're trying to make your life easy, uh, easier, yeah, I, I wouldn't, you know, don't be like me and really uh, harp on trying to make it perfect because at the end of the day, as long as it provides value to you, um, that's really the best you can ask for.